Jay, thanks for that wonderful introduction. <laughs> um, compliments to, to the panel on what was an excellent input, and it's good to see a good cross-spectrum, the role of government or policy, uh, potential anchor customers, someone coming from the supply industry, and then also uh, off-takers in South Africa. Um, 2023 seems to be this magical pivot point um, where we now know we're not only running out of power, but we'll also be running out of gas. Because that was the first time I think um, Yaku's presentation has been sort of in the public domain as, as, as uh, well articulated as it was. I have a concern, and uh, I guess the question here is to the IPP office, and it also probably relates to if somebody was here from, from Transnet. Under best estimates, I think the front-end development period for uh, any LNG project or import project or pipeline import project for that matter, whether it's linked to power generation or whether it's um, linked to substituting a replenishing re reserve in Mozambique, will take at least three years, at least, if not four, of front-end development. And depending on what infrastructure solutions or market solutions you have after that, you've probably got another two to three years of actual construction and, and commissioning. Sorry, Chris, do I need to do something? Yeah. Um, that, that, in my simple math, is then six to seven years. And we're in the back end of 2019. That's puts us at 2027. Um, the medium term system adequacy outlook hasn't been published yet. Uh, we don't know if ESCOM is going to get exemption on minimum emission standards on, all, on some of its plant. So we could even see a more rapid um, uh, retiring of ESCOM fleet and we're running out of gas. Do we have, and here's my question to the panel, do we have the luxury of time to still be considering things like, is it uh, Transnet that does it at uh, Richards Bay? Is it an IPP office project at Kuha? Um, who plays what role with government? Is it bundled? Is it unbundled? Do we really have that luxury of time to avoid a crisis? Question one, and then a very last and quick question, and it, it builds on the comment that John made. Is the possibility to anchor, other than power, a reality? And I ask that because to say power at 10% load factor is the reality of the IRP, I don't know that that's achievable with an LNG solution. There's certainly an economic case, but there might not be the commercial or technical <coughs> argument that supports that economic case. Thanks very much, Chris. Thank you. Um, I'm told the next uh, gentleman to speak is Richard. You've got the mic now. Thanks very much. <laughs> Sorry, I was right at the back there. Um, thanks very much for those presentations. Um, my question originally was anticipating that there might be a rather more gung-ho attitude in the room, so I have to modify my question. But basically, it's about um, what John talked about, um, the capacity for um, over-articulating the shortness of the bridge, perhaps. So it's great to see people recognizing that the role of gas is going to be as a bridge in a transition to a zero carbon economy eventually. Um, what I'd like to hear from is a bit more of the forward looking. Um, we've heard a lot about the rather dire situation we're in at the moment. Um, but of course, time is not a luxury. Time is something that you can't short circuit. So given that we're on the back foot and there's talk of huge amounts of investment in a growing a gas economy, as um, the uh, as well Minister Tino Peterson used to say. Um, the concern from a lot of civil society is, I'm Richard Rutherington, I work at civil society organizations in the Frederick Hubert Stiftung, is that we'll be over-investing in gas at a time when the future prospects are fairly clear in the long term, but not in the medium term. So what do you see as the potential tipping points to determine how long the bridge should be or what the role for gas would be in South Africa and the region um, in a responsible transition to a low carbon and eventually a carbon neutral economy? And given the kind of tipping points we've got facing us, um, you know, Peru gas, for example, there's, there's plenty to suggest that, that it isn't going to offer net value to society to develop our, our Karoo gas 
through fracking, um, given that it's going to take so long for it to be developed and there's going to be increasing the pressure. And um, someone mentioned the best case for gas in comparison to coal being that gas could have 50% less greenhouse gas emissions. That's you know, the point of burning, that's the best you can achieve. But given fugitive methane leakage along the natural gas supply chain, which in some instances has been reported as fully offsetting any gains over coal in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, is in terms of CO2, yeah. Yeah, the CO2 emissions, but the fugitive methane along the supply line can totally undercut the, the reductions of CO2 emissions. So is there, for example, a benchmark for fugitive methane above which you would say if you Let's say if you can't stay below 2% of total leakage well to combustion, um, would that be a, a basis to rule out certain supply chain? Is, is there any kind of benchmark there? Because coal, coal can't provide the benchmark for gas going forward. In power supply, it's going to be wind or solar with storage that gas has to compete with to some extent. The key advantage for, for gas in power is, of course, system service, the, the, the system value of gas in terms of dealing with intermittency coming in. Um, one of the presentations suggested it's good for our energy security. From a South African perspective, I would argue that's not much of a game for gas, really, given what all of the options are. So yeah, if you could talk a little bit future forward looking about just what is a responsible role for gas, particularly in South Africa. Thank you. Um, Two questions. Basically, we currently doing a lot of work at the moment for one of the big companies on the board of uh, Transit, etc., and we're looking at the, uh, the demand, demand profiles across the country. Um, what's very obvious to me and obviously to the team is that the key key issue is about policy and regulatory, and also most importantly about tax. People tend to forget about the importance of tax, and. To, to, give a clear, uh, to give a clear view of what the, we, it would be good to get a clear view of what governments and the Treasury's view on tax on LNG and others would be in the future. And the reason for that is that the price point of, of gas is so important that depends the up, that affects the rate of uptake. So I think the key question to the panel would be, have they got a view on tax related to LNG? And have they got any any recommendations to government on how to tax and what to do? Uh, the second the second question is that where LNG has worked in the world, there's been very strong policy and incentives. Uh, this is in China, etc. These policy incentives have been strong uh, a strong um, support of gas. We don't see that in the green transport plan. We don't see that in any of the master plans. Uh, and we would like to get the panels beyond that too. Thank you. Thank you. Let's get ladies. Uh, one, two, ladies, and those the, la the ladies. So we'll get the three ladies and then we'll get the answers. Thank you very much. It's Mariam Issa from Finweek magazine. My question is about fracking. Um, it's been a game changer in many places. However, South Africa is a water scarce country and getting more so as climate change progresses. For that reason and that reason only, given that fracking is a water intensive process, is it wise to keep this on the table to consider it at all? <coughs> Thank you, Marianne. Thank you very much. My name is Cindy from the BRICS Energy Working Group. I must actually thank Chris for inviting us here today and also with the lovely panel. And I think one of the most important things, um, Chairman, is that we are getting somewhere, which is um, looking at the panel that we have today, which is private sector government, and even some of the users and even big um, industries that are here today. But I think for me, what is really crucial um, from the IPP office is the issue of the framework itself. Because it's very important to actually look at the framework so that when we hit the ground running, we know that everything has been covered. Because that's very important on its own. Because, I mean, I, I used to work in one company in the UK. It was called Emiotech Energy Africa. 
And if you look at the UK system, I mean, it's about gas stoves across UK. Now, if you look at South Africa, no one thought that one day there's going to be Danefin. <laughs> Sorry. No one thought that one day there's going to be Eagle Canyon. That's middle class. But also at the same time, how do we, as government again, make sure that in the next developmental phase, we come up with a system of actually introducing the gas stove system? Because that's another alternative source of energy. So that becomes integrated on its own in terms of moving forward and make sure, because now we need to talk about the real implementation so that we'll be able to actually test the model to see whether it's working on. I mean, if you, you spoke about Mozambique, you know, when we didn't have electricity in South Africa in terms of the Sadak power pool, Mozambique came to our rescue South Africa. And the very same plant that is in Mozambique at the moment, I think it can actually, you know, make the whole of the Sadak region, including our South East South Africa. But how do we make sure that we, we have an integrated approach. I know Bumalanga government is trying to actually focus on that, but how far the process has gone, I'm, I'm not quite too sure. Maybe the IPP office can actually assist that. So this is my comment. Great work, chairperson, chairman, but at the end of the day, let us just hit the ground running because we've got the right people, the right platform. So let us just hit the ground running and make sure that the gas sector in South Africa, it's a reality because even if you look at the, the continent, 650 people don't have uh, you know, access to electricity in the continent on its own. And you're talking about what? One billion people? And where's the rest of the electricity will come from? So we need to actually use gas as well as one of those key drivers and those key pillars because power is very important when you're looking at economic upturn. You can't develop any economy without power. So for me, this is exciting, advocate. Thank you very much for actually you know, making yourself available as government to present to the private sector and even the users so that we can have a way forward. Thank you, Chris. Thank you very much, Cindy. Ma'am, there's a hand over here and to the right. Good morning, Gina Schroeder from LWS. We invest in energy projects. I have in my hands a strong expression of interest from a US-based international group that wish to lease a berth or wharfage from Transnet in Richards Bay for 25 years. They're prepared to put all the investment in to be able to do the offloading from an FSRU and they do not require any market aggregation. All they require is some ability to be able to bid into a very simple process to be able to supply gas, to be able to lease a wharf. And from that point onwards, they are firmly of the belief that they'll be able to grow the gas economy, they'll be able to finalize negotiations to put gas into the lily line and go from there. And my question is, is there in any way in this country a process that one can follow that doesn't require five years of bureaucratic rigmarole before we can do this? Thank you, um, ladies and gentlemen, for those questions. So we had the three that were planted in the men's room, <laughs> and, then, and then the others that were, 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 were in the room. Um, I think the first one was from Daryl, and uh, he's talking about we are running out of uh, gas and electricity. Do we have a luxury of time? Uh, who wants to take that one? Okay. I still have it. Okay. Um, I think we've, we've um, reached a consensus amongst all the panellists that, no, we don't have the luxury of time. Um, a, 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 as I've indicated, a, uh, an alignment is critically necessary. Um, uh, it's not today, it should have been yesterday. So um, I believe that on the positive, the fact that um, mineral resources and energy have now been merged under a single minister certainly will help to take this matter forward. Uh, it's certainly something that, as an IPP office, we will be reporting back. Uh, we've been advocating for the alignment, 
uh, and the sooner the better. However, I should indicate that things didn't stand still. Uh, mention was made of the work that Transnet has done, uh, CDC has done work on Kucha. Um, so much work for, uh, has been done in terms of, of those two ports, <coughs> but we need to prioritize. Um, mention was made of Mozambique. Um, I believe uh, James mentioned the, um, I believe, 2,000 megawatt concession uh, in Mozambique. As a matter of interest, the uh, 2015 determination included the possibility of cross-border imports. So um, all of these possibilities need to be looked at to ensure that we, one, address the the electricity supply shortages, um, hopefully by 2024 or soon thereafter. Um, as far as the gas uh, supply shortages are concerned, um, I, we take note of the, the interest um, of the American firm and, and to the extent that the IPP office can facilitate at least a point of entry, uh, you're most welcome to contact us. Uh, but we are also asking the private sector, as, uh, uh, as in the case of this example, to step forward, help us define uh, more definitively what the pent-up demand is, help us to uh, address the matter of aggregation, if required, uh, and how that can be embarked on. Um, this cannot only be a matter of policy legislative deficiency. We see current investment already. So uh, with that, I'm not suggesting that the policy gaps and the legislative gaps shouldn't be filled. Uh, but I think if we're going to be stuck in that debate, um, it's not going to take us forward. This has to be a joint initiative. With regard to how long that bridge is, um, our view at the IPP office is that, and I believe John alluded to that as well, that um, gas will continue to play a role uh, with regard to the longer term uh, grid stability, if I say longer term, um, the grid stability requirements are four hours and, and longer. That ESS at this point in time, and at least for the foreseeable future, will not fill that gap. Thank you, thank you. I think you, you touched on a, a couple of things, but um, you may have forgotten the one question around anchoring other than for gas to power. What other anchor? I think that was uh, Daryl's uh, question. Sorry, I, I walked in at that point in time. Uh, let me just um, clarify. We do not, uh, we're not of the view that the gas to power is not a critical anchoring element. But I, where we believed in the past that a bundled approach could actually encapsulate the full anchoring requirement, I do not think that the electricity consumer can absorb the cost and risk related to that. We have to look at a, a, a um, combined approach with regard to third-party offtake, and therefore I'm emphasizing the, the collaboration from an aggregation point of view. Of course, a gas-to-power program will be one of the key vehicles, but it, we cannot anchor a whole gas economy on a gas-to-power program. Um, Andy made the point that ultimately it's the consumer um, that pays for all of this, and we need to consider the ability of the electricity consumer to actually absorb uh, all of these costs. Thank you. And Richard then asked um, about the role of gas. It says, are we over investing in gas? And how long is this uh, transition bridge uh, should be in terms of the gas? And then he asked the, the methane question again. Um, who wants to take that? John, you are? Sure, I'll, uh, I'll maybe give an <laughs> input there. Um, so I, I think one needs to look at the gas bridge question from an electricity viewpoint, but then from a wider energy vehicle utilization viewpoint. Um, on the electricity side, um, you know, I think in my presentation, you know, from a global act perspective, we're invested in renewables and in gas. So we're sort of agnostic in terms of um, wanting to have one over the other. 
But I think uh, in a kind of South African um, perspective, we would see gas having a longer bridge than say in a Northern Europe um, or a Californian perspective where the pricing is able to bear uh, over investment in batteries, for example, to achieve policy imperatives of bringing down carbon emissions as much as possible. I think that ability to withstand premium as Sandra uh, described in a different context uh, is not uh, as available in certainly in the African continent, but also in South Africa. So from that fact alone, we see a little bit of a longer bridge. Um, that's then amplified by whether you're looking at two hour, four hour, eight hour beyond shifting. Um, and, uh, you know, that's a, a, again, Sandra, I think is, is making reference to that point as well. And I think in the South African power sector energy mix that the IRP uh, has to be implemented on the back of, you have to look at um, what the system needs. Uh, and it often is that longer term load shifting requirement. So I think there will be a role for gas. I would just um, offer as well, um, you know, I think even some of the grids that have, um, from a policy standpoint, uh, made as an imperative to move to zero carbon futures are starting to think a little bit more about the evening peak and when you have solar and the steepness of that curve. So Cal the California systems operator, for example, and I think the International Energy Agency is about to publish a big piece around this in November, which should be quite interesting which even in those contexts, there still could be a continuing role, albeit smaller for gas. So in the power sector, in the African context, and even in the South African context, I think we have a long bridge ahead of us for gas. I think the power needs are huge. We've had one of the most successful renewables programs in the world in South Africa hosted here, and yet it still makes up a small percentage of our energy mix which underlines the challenge of implementation um, of these programs going forward in terms of meeting scale challenge. And if you think that we have 12 gigawatts of coal coming out of commission in the next eight to 10 years, that's an enormous gap that has to be met in the rest of the continent. It's actually building um, the generation to meet demand over the increasing demand picture. And I just wanna say the last thing is to move beyond the power sector. Uh, if we look at shipping, for example, in the world, um, tying into Andy's uh, putting his former hat on um, leading Stasco, um, key elements of Stasco. But, um, you know, that currently is fueled almost entirely by very, very dirty HFO. There is uh, potential implementation of very enhanced standards there, which is going to lead to, um, you know, a shifting of either getting to cleaner diesel or to scrubbers. And I think there's going to be some imbalance in the market. Uh, ideally, an outcome there is the shift to LNG propulsion. It's very hard to see the bulk shipping of our world, which makes up a significant portion of our energy demand globally, shifting to um, a renewable zero carbon basis. So there is a role to gas to play beyond power regardless. And that takes us into the discussion of Yako and others, and, and Sandra making it that for the South African economy as well, there's enormous decarbonization benefits in terms of that additional beyond power utilization of gas uh, in the economy. Um, is fracking the answer? Uh, I think in the list of potential sources of supply, you would see it came towards the bottom. We don't have the luxury to ignore any potential source, um, but it's something we need to weigh the costs and benefits of very carefully indeed, including the value chain methane leakage. Uh, you know, if you look at China and its move to um, go gas, it's as much about socks and other particulates as it is about CO2. Um, and that is a significant issue when it comes to wood burning as well. In our societies, we have enormous rates of asthma and ever other lung um, diseases that we have to address. Um, and if that can be addressed in part by gas increasingly in the economy alongside of renewables where available, you know, that's the kind of energy picture that is a appropriately Africanized and localized one, in my view. Yeah, thank you. Okay. The next one was from, oh, sorry, you wanted to add on? Yeah, no, no. Let, me, let me also just com comment on, on Richard's good question. Firstly, um, yes, it's uh, perhaps not always understood that greenhouse gas has two components, the CO2 component and the methane component. And yes, uh, unless the, the value chain leakage can be reduced to below 2%, then, uh, th then you don't really gain. Um, and uh, th the main leakage usually happens in the, in the upstream piece. Uh, and, but I'm, I'm clear that, and for if one does not know that, it's about a 20% a 
more potent greenhouse gas than, uh, than CO2 methane. So uh, the, the industry is working very hard to clean up its act to make sure that all actuators, all valves, uh, all leakage points are, are, are addressed and uh, it is the, the good role that environmental organizations play to, to, to pressurize the industry which has resulted in that. Thank you for that. Okay. Um, regarding the gas bridge, uh, if, if you ask me, uh, and it's, it's the, the, how long will it last depends a little bit on which continent one speaks to and at, at a global level I will say that the, 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 the most authoritative agency that I consider on that looks at the global energy perspective would be the International Agen Energy Agency and I'm quite comfortable that the that, that gas is going to play a very significant role in terms of that transition uh, for at least two to three to four decades. Um, and that is simply because of the sheer size of the global energy industry. Uh, I often find it difficult to, the, the energy industry is the world's largest industry. And, and uh, we are today discussing the world's largest industry. In, in South Africa, it's also a very large industry. And uh, when people ask me, how big is it? I say, today, on the 18th of September 2019, I'll pick one company, I'll just pick Shell because I used to work for Shell, I still work for Shell for, for a short while, but um, if I ask you to just think of one number, what percentage of the end use energy in the world today is supplied by Shell? And the answer is one, okay? Now th that gives you, and, and so, uh, and, and Shell supplies round numbers about three million barrels of oil equivalent per day. The, la the, the, the third largest energy company in the world after Saudi Aramco and ExxonMobil. That's an indication of the scale of the transformation that lies ahead if we want to rebuild a hundred shells into the, the new energy world. It should happen. Uh, it should happen faster than we can afford, but it's not going to happen in a year or two. The post-carbon economy is not uh, to arrive, about to arrive before 2023. Uh, it, will, it will take some decades as, as it readjusts faster than is affordable, but if it, if it happens too fast, the government goes because the, the community and the society and industry can't afford it. So it's a very tightrope balance that we walk. Thank you, Andy. Um, for that extra information. Faiz's question, I think, could be dealt by you, Sandra, around the tax on LNG and, um, and, and, and incentives. Um, well, first of all, I cannot speak for the National Treasury, but um, I think it's uh, well known uh, that the carbon tax Act has been promulgated, uh, I believe, through the application of the carbon tax legislation, an indirect incentive towards low carbon um, technologies um, is provided. As to an LNG specific incentive, um, we're not aware of that at this point in time. Um, uh, it's something that we will have to consider within the bigger scheme of the, the realities around the dollarization of the commodity. Um, uh, and we have continued engagements with the National Treasury on that. Any thoughts or proposals, welcome to share with us. Thanks. Yeah, I think it works. Yeah. So, thanks. So, I think just, just two comments, I think, and uh, was also uh, posed by by fires is is around the price point for gas and, and what we currently have and what we what we faced with going forward the um, the way we see it right now is that gas gas pricing is likely to rise uh, by about 30 percent through LNG imports rather than piped gas coming across from Mozambique and that of course has a significant impact on 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 the on the profitability of of our operations so the question is, how do you mitigate that? And, and um, I mean, if, if LNG is the answer, uh, at least for the next five or ten years, 
how do you mitigate this cost impact? And the only way that you could do that is on the basis that you've got unlimited access to molecules. You could actually start substituting molecules internally in, ter in terms of your own basket, which would reduce your overall cost of energy, notwithstanding the in increased price of, of, of uh, gas going forward. So that's, a, that's an important principle that we debate a lot. Um, so the, 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 the imperative is that, that we do have access to molecules. Um, it's not necessarily the price point per se. We can do something with that price point, provided we have the molecule. Um, <coughs> I think the, the I just, there was an earlier question around the um, luxury of time and, and um, is power the only <coughs> aggregator or the one that's gonna make it work? No, definitely not. I think uh, the, the, the power, power certainly assists. I think the way power is positioned in the IRP 2018, it's not going to result in this sudden uh, uh, development of gas infrastructure in South Africa. I think um, uh, you mentioned earlier that, that the, the, the it's, it's certainly not going to be a, 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 a baseload cash plant. The, uh, it's certainly going to be a peaking plant. There's gas volumes there. But gas, gas demand needs to be seen across three pockets or three baskets. The one is certainly gas to power because that, that certainly provides uh, uh, demand for molecules. The other one is industrial demand, which includes, of course, industry and, and SASL today. Um, and the third basket is, is, is uh, yeah, the, the sort of, let's call it the SASL basket. So it's in industry, SASL, and um, and um, uh, uh, gas uh, uh, gas to power. So the question Ma is, maybe how you do could you uh, add transport to that as well? Exactly. You you could add transport to it. You yeah. could maybe bring in the mining sector. You can bring in the. Uh, so the question is, how do you aggregate this into a number, and where do you position this, and how do you position this? And I think that's that's the biggest challenge that we face today. Um, have we run out of time? Yes, we have. Um, we've we've rested on our laurels over the last seven years. Um, and and uh, industry is is trying to find solutions very urgently around uh, pending pending gas gas shortage. I, I would just like to maybe offer um, some observations uh, around that. I think we, we have a a greenfield challenge, value chain challenge in South Africa, and that is an acute one because we are not just seeking to capitalize and successfully finance and close an import facility. We have to anchor this as well. And, um, you know, I, I always say in my experience of the LNG value chain, just speaking personally, the idea of build it and they will come just does not apply. Um, the commercial uh, chain and the finding supplier and linking to buyers has to come first and infrastructure will follow. And infrastructure has a habit of not getting to close if that isn't the case, mm -hmm. or if it does get to close, <coughs> becoming a white elephant. Um, and so, um, I just there was a question around a U.S. company willing to come in immediately and do this, and and I like the intent behind that question because we should be doing our best to find fast solutions and take red tape and bureaucracy out of the way. But at the same time, the LNG value chain and establishing a gas industry is a very challenging one that takes some orchestration, whatever eventual model that you have energy planning, logistics planning, connecting the dots between the supply and, and, and the chain. I mean, you can take a bucket of oil and you can sell it for Naira in a village in Nigeria. <coughs> there is no such thing as a bucket of gas. Um, it takes a, a lot more coordination. And so I would just say, if we seek to anchor LNG import through aggregation, that aggregator is going to have to benefit from huge credit support in the first place. That probably means government, unless there's a private sector entity with a credit rating that's large enough to back this. It has not been done in this way, so we are facing a novel challenge. Um, and I think part of the challenge there is the logistics of aligning the demand of users with the supply constraints that come in the, in the way that supply comes in. Um, you know, LNG comes in large-scale cargo volumes until small-scale LNG takes off, and that we're still waiting for that to happen at scale. Um, and so managing, you have to be ready to receive that full volume and dispatch in one day with your receiving terminal unless you overbuild storage. So you have to have reduced 
used the gas before the next ship arrives, so you pay huge penalties. So there's some real constraints. These are constraints that are solved regularly all over the world in 40 importing countries, but they're not ones that are solved uh, with snapping of the fingers and with atomistic individual player solutions. It's going to take a degree of coordination. And just the final thing I would say is that it doesn't mean we have to arrive at a central planned model. Um, I think South Africa potentially has the opportunity to host a couple of different models in terms of LNG import that would still be consistent with our overall NDP and energy planning. And one may well be a more private sector and less regulated model, but the preconditions of which are put into place on a credible basis. Um, another may be a more procurement model um, you know, that, that aligns the value chain and, and properly anchors things and overbuilds um, to enable an industry to take off in a certain circumstance. So I, I would just offer those observations. Well, thank you, thank you. Um, Marianne asked the question, said, we talk about fracking, fracking, we don't have water. What on earth are we doing? Paraphrased you, hey? freaking story, is it worth it because we are a water scarce country and we're going to be increasingly water scarce, is it worth it? I mean, I, I attempted a, a start to an answer to that question. I, I would just fill out that articulation. I think there are other nearer term sources that are more available to the South African gas economy. That probably includes the African economy. Um, I think, though, at the same time, we just don't have enough information whatsoever to make any kind of intelligible assessment. Um, so that information is going to have to flow into that. I think there's time frame challenges to that. So I think it's going to put it down the list of our priority. But our unconventional gas sector and the coal bed methane side that Yako outlined in some of his presentation is an example where um, you know things have have moved forward um, at a smaller scale. Um, and, you know, again, we do not have the luxury of turning our nose at any energy source, but it has to be properly evaluated, including all of the pros and cons. Um, and we'll need to come to that. But I think the enormous regional scale intra-Africa supply opportunities, the LNG markets where they are, which despite the challenges that we've been articulating, are still extremely favorable to new importing countries if the right model is created the total recent discovery of gas condensates and the potential for additional resource in that block alone, let alone some of the other offshore um, blocks that present a more traditional uh, reservoir based with some of the less challenges that you've articulated from the crew shale gas and the fact that a kind of big bang development of the crew shale gas that was maybe available in coal seam gas in Australia, uh, in Alberta, in terms of the upstream, appears to not be available in South Africa, all leads one to de-emphasize that as a near-term source of supply. I think coupled to that um, uh, is, Tabang, is, is the, whether, whether fracking will happen in South Africa, I, I, I agree fully with, with John saying, I think it's sort of shifting way down the list of uh, opportunities and priorities. And the, the, um, any of these projects, as we've indicated earlier on, whether it's shale gas, whether it is Kudu or, uh, or uh, Block 2A, all those will ultimately have to compete with, with uh, global LNG markets. Currently, you can land gas at around about between 6 and $7 on the shores of South Africa, gasified. So uh, the question is, you know, is, is that competitive? Um, and yeah, uh, to your point, we don't know yet. We certainly don't know yet, but I think, I think the viability of these projects will by and large be dictated by uh, the global price for LNG, which is becoming a singular price, like uh, I think you mentioned it earlier. And, and av additional available um, Gulf of Guinea, West Africa supply, Train 7 in Nigeria is uh, close to financial close. Um, with portfolio gas of LNG available from that close, there hasn't been a requirement for 100% to be backstopped. You have Angola LNG, so a kind of global LNG that may be replaced mm -hmm. by regional LNG trade as well. I see that Tellurian, uh, one of the US LNG companies, has just offered a fixed price LNG contract from 2023 on a long-term basis at $8. 
Um, so of course, one of the challenges, Jaco, as I, I know you're aware of, but in the six to seven dollar quote is that it, that is still on an indexation basis. Yeah. And uh, you know, if the Henry Hub price underpinning that were to rise, though many commentators think it's locked in for some time, um, those prices can move. But the fact that uh, you have some players starting to dip their toe in the water of, um, of more kind of fixed price arrangements or uh, pricing of LNG that is more insulated from swings in indexation um, is, is helpful. Yeah. There's uh, just, just as a matter of interest, some, one of the oil majors shared with me recently that there's actually now negative pricing on gas in, in the States. That that's at wellhead in many of the shale gas fields, um, where you pay for transport for your gas, yep. but you're also having to pay to have your gas evacuated. It's associated gas with oil, so that underpins a International Energy Association um, view of uh, you know gas available at Henry Hub at a pretty low price for a long term. And then there was a comment, uh, maybe a question around the gas stove system. I'm paraphrasing here and I'm hoping I've gotten everything you wanted to say, Cindy, here, about real implementation of what we're talking about. Can you take away? Yeah, I, I, I think it's a very interesting comment because uh, we, we, we all, we all uh, you know, if anyone is a foodie in this room, <laughs> we all prefer to cook on gas. Um, I think there's certainly a place for it. What is interesting, however, is, uh, and that's what I've learned last week um, in, in, in Holland, in the Netherlands, there's actually a move away from gas cooking, um, purely because renewables are taking the place of electricity. So there's a move towards electricity again, from a cooking perspective. So that, that just sort of, uh, I'm, I'm not saying we in Africa are at that point. I mean, we, we're still <coughs> cooking mainly on off, off wood, you yeah. know. Uh, and, and heavy carbon, carbon fuel. So uh, is there a place for it? Absolutely, but it requires networks and, and distribution channels. Um, I think uh, Johannesburg has got an extensive uh, domestic gas network. Um, um, are there any other potential? Yes, of course, I think so, but it, it, it requires investment, business cases, those sort of things. Okay, let's go now to the second round. Can I see hands? First hand there, and the second one, third, fourth, fifth. Okay, we have those five. Um, first, the man in the beard. You tell us your name once you get the mic. Thank you. My name is Mike Pontus. I'm a consultant. Um, I'd like to congratulate Jaco on leading to the check. What we've seen today is that we've seen a sea change from relying on electricity now relying on what the market would like. That's quite important to take into account. So really the question is look at the market. You mentioned from IGU 50 million giga, uh, million giga joules per annum. If you think up what SASL will take, you talk about 150 million giga joules altogether more, it's maybe 180 as they talk about now. And that is sufficient to anchor on the small scale side a normal LNG plant, whether it be Richards Bay or in Maputo. So that's possible, and I'm glad to see that now it's in the court of private developers, because that means it will go fast, and it has to go fast, because the Red uh, Gas Disappearing Act is happening as we speak, as you might rightly say. So I see that you, as a customer, would be the important thing. The only question is, can you afford, and can Sassel afford, the issue? And I don't think it's six to seven, I think it's eight to nine, uh, and dollars a million BTU, but that's probably the right price. If Sassel can afford that, then we have an opportunity. And then my question to you, Yako, if I may, okay, is why do you say only 16 million individuals going to be imported by FSRU in Kutu? Uh, I would imagine if you've got an FSRU there, you just put in an 80 kilometer pipeline compressor, and within a year and a half, providing the offtake agreements, you've got FSRU yeah. in Kutu. This yeah. is the problem of delaying government decision. Yeah. We suddenly now in the hands of a longer term import terminal in another country. Right. And we get to the issue of Russia and how you get the gas from Russia to Europe, yeah. how you get the gas from Mozambique to South Africa. Yeah. Because clearly the Mozambican government has taken an attitude the gas is for the country quite rightly so. And you see that in the Tamande uh, Tamande 420 megawatt power plant where they insist 
I'll try and uh, answer those. So I think let's let's try to get the mm -hmm. let's, just, Sorry. let's just reply to him, otherwise <laughs> I'm gonna forget as well. <laughs> <laughs> let's okay. I also want to remind quick, quickly, it's you go first. Right, so so uh, I, I, I'm going to answer your question in, in two ways or, or your statements. The the role of volume and all that, of course, Sassel Sassel is is equally concerned, and that's our understanding. Equally concerned about gas volumes. Now, I mean, Sassel is the single largest user of, of gas volumes in South Africa, and we should not forget that Sassel was also the single aggregator for the development of the infrastructure that we have today. So. There was a question earlier, are there other alternatives? Of course there are. It's not only power, but there's petrochemical plants, there's all these other, other, other areas and industries. So <coughs> Sassel is equally concerned, um, and uh, we understand that that is, that is Sassel's number two strategic imperative, um, is to find feedstock for their, for their operations. Can they operate at the, let's call it the $8 level or the $10 de level delivered? Um, some of their businesses, and they've shared this with us uh, in, in, in a public forum, f some of their businesses, largely in the chemical space, will be under pressure. You know. So it is uh, LNG for a part of, of Sassel's business is certainly not an option um, by the sounds of it. Can industry afford it? I think there is a space for it, provided there's unlimited mo molecules available. To my earlier point, if you can start balancing your own energy basket in other words, using less electricity, generating your own through gas, through embedded operations, etc. You can start to balance that energy point, and I think the outcome of that will be a lower energy cost on a weighted average basis. On the question of capacity, um, of course, I, you know, we can bring all the LNG in through Maputo, provided there's capacity to transport it. My 16 million gigajoule comment was related to the current capacity in the Romco. Right. So with loop line three and four, that could easily become a hundred million uh, gigajoule capacity, for example, that you could bring in additionally over and above uh, uh, that. But without doing anything fancy, uh, yes, there's a short link pipeline required in, uh, in Mozambique, the way we understand it. But without doing anything fancy in terms of the Romco capacity and, and compression and all that, there's about 16 million, which is the bottleneck. The Gauteng network is a matter of interest. There's about 44 million gigajoule capacity at the moment, additional capacity, right? unused, underutilized capacity. So there's this huge, uh, uh, um, and, and, and comes back to earlier comment around the pent up demand for gas. And uh, that is far greater than what we currently consume. <coughs> In some ways, I want to use the, to answer Mike's question, just come back to the, the, the question that Gina posed about an, an import terminal in the Richards Bay area. The, um, in, in most countries of the world, the, the way that that problem would be tackled and solved would be simply say, I want to, to bring in an energy cargo, we're going to uh, rent or buy a, uh, an RFSU, there has to be a pipeline, but most importantly we need to find a buyer, an anchoring buyer which could be from industrial sector, from the petrochemical sector, which could be from the power sector. Uh, and once, once that buyer has been found at, at an agreed price for an agreed term, uh, that's a fairly complex transaction, as John explained earlier, but that's what we do. That's, what, uh, that's how the world constructs that little micro value chain that, uh, that, that John spoke of earlier. However, if we're first going to say, well, we first want to decide whether we're going to have a nuclear program, then we want to decide we want to build more coal. Then we want to decide whether when the next IPP is going to come. Then we'll get to your question, Gina. It will never happen. Okay, so please keep up your challenge. And it was also in part my challenge. We uh, in South Africa need to land our first energy cargo so that we can believe that we actually have that option. And uh, somewhere between you and Sandra, the, uh, the solution lies. Keep talking to each other, please. <laughs> Um, uh, actually, Andy's uh, opened a very important point. Um, we've, we've used language in different ways today. Um, effectively, what we're saying is um, it's not an either-or. Uh, we need <coughs> an electricity buyer and we need a broader market buyer. 
or buyers, that offtake has crystallized as equally important because the learning for me today, and, and, and we've known this, but it's been confirmed, is that we need scale yep. to land that first. So if, yep. if this was a decision tree, where do we start? And I think the challenge is the how. Uh, where do we start? We need to get that scale. And if it's a joint aggregation, then so be it. But some form of aggregation, including electricity, but also third party purpose, is critically important. And I believe that's where we really have to take <coughs> an SA in view. We're very keen to engage in the dialogue uh, around what is that aggregated number? Um, it will grow, but we have to start somewhere. Uh, we already have some indication with the calculation around 1,000 megawatts 2024, whether that's achievable or not. That's an easy calculation. The difficult calculation is the other side. And, and there we have to work uh, both from a, a public entity perspective and a private sector perspective, and we need to get a, we need to find mm. the transaction vehicle to buy at scale, uh, and I believe the rest will follow. Yep. I think uh, adding to that, I mean, you know, I, I I always refer to South Africa. We we our economy, and and you know, we <laughs> we sometimes too arrogant, I think, but we're not in the billions and trillions game, right? Um, and we need to find the best solution, and I think those solutions are there. There's sufficient scale to do something uh, to to unlock this position, and but but it it requires the 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 uh, we need a vehicle, the three, the aggregation of the three baskets. Okay, I'm going to ask um, colleagues when we ask our questions to be a bit short, so we can get as many as we can. I know you're shaking your head; it's unfair. Shame, sorry. <laughs> Okay, hi. Um, I'm Carl from DID. I've got three hopefully short questions. First, number one. Uh, biogas. There's been a lot of talk about uh, energy. Um, is there a place for biogas in this whole sector, or is it just too small? Uh, secondly, it's our experience that gas is about two to three times more expensive than coal at the boiler uh, where you work with it. Is it not worthwhile to just to clean up our coal bank? Uh, this question I've been asked. And then lastly, you've talked about it being a uh, gateway or a, uh, I've got word now, but is, can gas be a gateway to hydrogen uh, with respect to the technology uh, that's being used and the lessons that are used? Thanks. Nicely put, three nice short question. There was a hand here. Yes. Thank you to uh, the panelists and everyone uh, for the uh, insightful presentations. My name is Azora Zulu and I am working with the city of Joburg. Um, we are actually in the process of developing a policy um, on net zero carbon buildings. Um, so we are actually also, I mean, meeting the global climate imperatives of actually limiting our um, carbon emissions or carbon dioxide emissions to um, actually meet the Paris Agreement. Um, so I think John spoke of the uncertainty within the um, um, renewable energy investment space um, because globally it seems that we are actually um, promoting renewable energy investments rather than gas. And the case is that South Africa, the bridge might be longer. Um, but I think um, as a four city, so um, we're part of the C40 um, South Africa Buildings Program. Um, the four cities um, including Joburg, Swane, Durban, and Etekwini. So imagine if we are all developing these policies where we are actually requiring people to actually become more energy efficient, which is reducing their energy load, and actually the, 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 energy, the energy supply would be obviously generated from renewable energy sources especially if we put the preference for on-site renewable generation, so embedded generation, and then off-site um, generation. So this is basically like the direction that we're moving in, and we're expecting that new developments need to start sharing this by 2030. 
So I think also it also links to the question that Gretchen was talking about in terms of um, the over, are we actually over investing in such a transitionary short, um, obviously we call this gas um, energy supply like a short term bridge. Are we, are we actually over investing where we actually need to obviously consolidate our efforts towards um, decarbonizing um, so just moving, instead of just transitioning and actually spending money, um, why are we not actually looking at actually decarbonizing? And maybe gas could still, they still be used for gas, um, maybe for domestic uses, but um, is there even, I, I'm just worried about the, 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 the direction that we're taking. <laughs> Um, we're moving one step forward, two step back, but but I mean I guess we'll obviously that's that's obviously the pathway that we obviously need to um, understand as ourselves. But I think for for my for my perspective, it's the <coughs> the thought behind um, investing so much efforts um, into um, into this um, gas industry, bridge. yeah, the short bridge. Where we know that the direction, the policy direction, there's going to be a strong policy direction that's moving towards actually meeting our global targets. Um, so yeah. Let's, let's, let's you were not that short, but thank you. Get <laughs> that one. Uh, good afternoon, colleagues. It's Paul Miller from City Power. Um, I've just got three basic questions. The first one is for Sandra. The value of gas generation is in capacity, not so much energy. And my issue is the single buyer model, because the single buyer ignores the value of, for example, placing a gas power generator smack bang in the middle of Gauteng in Jogo Kutwani to relieve the demand on Eskom. We pay a fortune to Eskom for, for those demand charges, whereas if you move the gas generation onto our networks, you make a savings there. So maybe already the consumer can afford it. Um, the point is to get it in the right place so that you realize the best benefit for it. So what are your views on the single buyer model and is there a chance we can change at least 30% of the energy market to a local market at least to, 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 to try and accommodate these opportunities, for example in Gauteng. Gauteng is sitting on the gas pipeline, there's not one gas generating service, we had to suffer load shedding, we couldn't make the economics worse work. And that comes to my second question, to try and get gas generation to compete with ESCO, You've got to get the price to something below 60 rand a gigajoule, which is almost impossible to do. So the problem I see it is, at the moment, the regulation of the gas price is done by NOSA, and it's based on an indexing methodology where you take the price of Eskom power and also coal and bunker oil, of all things, and that determines the price of gas. So if that's the case, how will gas power generation ever compete with Eskom power? So there's something fundamentally wrong with the pricing of, of, the, of, the, of the gas. The alternative method that NERSA could apply, and we may comment to this in the past, is to use the actual price. What is the wellhead price plus the transmission price plus the fair markup? And can we make the gas power generation work from that perspective? The next question is we haven't really, this, we haven't really looked at Sassel's role in this. Uh, you know, if you look at the oil industry, You've got Saudi Arabia as the swing state, so they control the price. If you look at the way the bad gas pipeline works, it flows from Mozambique under Gauteng to Secunda. So if it's more valuable to convert the, the gas molecules to liquid fuel, it forces Gauteng to pay an equivalent oil price for that gas. So there's something wrong with, with that, the way that works, because Sassel also has its own electricity generation, which is very profitable to them. But we can't seem to, as a country, get that generation put in the right place. So I think we need to understand Sassel's role in the existing market before we even think of the next market. And the last question I've got is, are there options to convert LNG to LPG? Because we don't have the appetite to invest in billions of rands of pipe gas, but we are very, very interested in getting gas to cooking because in metros and all the cities of Joburg, the evening peak is the killer for us. So if I can displace cooking load with gas, <laughs> it's already a benefit, but I don't have the appetite or the money to do that by piping it. It, it might be workable as a, as a bottle option. Thanks. Okay, yo, just load it. <laughs> okay, we get into answers now. Um, the first was from Paul. There were three questions. 
piled gas and the expense of uh, gas versus electricity. Yeah. Coal. Coal. Sorry. And then can and then the <coughs> one can gas be what? You forgot. Okay. <laughs> but but you will remember. Um, hydrogen. Yeah. Oh yeah. Can can gas be a gateway to hydrogen? hydrogen yeah. Yes. Takes yeah. that. Firstly, uh, was it Paul? Yes, Paul. Carl. Yes. Apologies, Carl. Um, Just baptized. <coughs> the um, <laughs> y y yes yes wherever biogas is produced either agriculturally or as a result of, of waste heat that should be developed should be uh, utilized for whatever purposes either in industrial or power generation there's probably not enough to support power generation in, in South Africa unless it is fed into another network yeah. bio biogas is methane uh, and and uh, could just uh, and could and should just supplement and as part of us running a very environmentally efficient of an environmentally conscious economy in, in, in South Africa. As far as gateway to hydrogen is concerned, no, I don't see, I don't, th there's, to my knowledge, nobody trying to construct a methane, uh, which is CH4 to H2 uh, chain uh, at all. Uh, the, the most, most uh, developed gateway to, to hydrogen is from surplus solar and wind power through electrolysis process that then gives you uh, hydrogen that, that, that needs to be stored. Um, and on, on the price, uh, I won't comment on price today. I mean, just on the price point, you know, I would point people to the IRP energy modeling. And um, so, you know, what if you look at the least cost modeling, that factors in the levelized cost of electricity and takes what the power system wants on a least cost basis. And that doesn't mean that the actual price per kilowatt hour of the of the um, different en generation mix is necessarily going to be reflected in the merit order just on a price per price basis. It's what attributes that that generation can deliver. So if you need to balance renewables, and I think that was part of my presentation in countries that don't have enormous reservoirs of gas, um, where the price of gas can come down to like a US pricing where you have, you know, a Henry Hub price around two to three dollars and that drives a very affordable electricity price. But where you're importing LNG and it's a higher price, you still need to balance, balance your renewables intermittency. And so your renewables are your least cost new build solution. And you're trying to maximize your renewables. But to do that, you have to uh, balance them and manage them and steward them on your grid. Eventually, hopefully, batteries provide a solution for a large part of that intermittency. Um, but I think as we've articulated, there's a bridge to that time frame for them to be commercially feasible. Um, and so that's where gas comes in, where coal has been considered a kind of base load and less flexible unless you're investing in higher cost versions of coal generation that can achieve some of the flexibility. But that takes you back into the affordability. So I think if one, some independent commentators like CSIR have publicly put out least cost dispatch of an energy planning model for South Africa um, that takes no policy considerations into account. Um, uh, and you know th that model solves for a significant amount of gas. And it's because it's balancing renewables, which is the least cost element that you're trying to maximize. And the final point I would just say to a couple points here is that I, I would really want us to avoid a kind of false competition between renewables and gas and for example, off-grid green solutions, which we should be trying to maximize all of those things, mm. right? And I think as I was trying to say, it's not like we have our supply meeting our demand if you take into account the next 10 to 12 years where we have 12 gigawatts of coal coming out of the system, right? That's an enormous gap that has to be addressed. Um, and that needs to be addressed, uh, I would submit, um, with as much renewables as we can conceivably do and the technology that's going to balance that in that time frame is likely gas. And let's like hope that batteries come in on an affordable basis to also supplement and be part of that story. But at, at the existing moment, that's not the case. Um, but the off-grid solutions, um, you know, should we should be focusing on is on the demand side and energy efficiency and on off-grid solutions that are as green as possible. So it's an all of the above, not either or. So that would include biogas? Yeah, no, I share Andy's view entirely on biogas.
All right, thank you very much. And I think as well as the uh, question was, uh, um, they are trying to get us all into green buildings and all that. Are we wasting our time on this guest story? Similar to a previous <coughs> question, I think. Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll maybe comment on that. I, I think from an from industrial perspective, I mean, we, we yes, we use buildings, but factories and these sort of things, I, I think I think there's a, if you look at the agendas of all, all industry in South Africa, there's certainly a desire to move to clean energy, I mean, with, without a doubt. But the question is availability, and the other one, of course, is cost. Right? I think business will start to levitate towards clean energy as availability and cost comes down. And, and at some point, there will be definitely a crossover point. Yeah. I think the city of Johannesburg should be congratulated with the other cities that you listed for for making sure that buildings are energy efficient, that they that they're green, and that they uh, are as close to zero carbon as possible. Be aware that that uh, in the process of doing that, uh, one says I'm not going to use the market mechanism to to have efficient design. So market mechanism mechanism of the price for energy and the price for water and the price for carbon. But I'm going to use the policy framework and say, thou shalt do the following. That, th that easily leads to uncompetitive decisions. <coughs> so at least constantly think through the implications of those policy decisions, uh, which leads to certain re requirements for, for buildings. And what does it mean in the end for somebody who needs to build it? And do you want to add? I think there was a uh, question around um, the single buyer versus yes. uh, the multiple buyers. Yes, yeah, and that is the, uh, the litany of questions from City Power. <laughs> 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 exactly. Um, it, it's a bit like um, looking into a glass ball and, and uh, uh, guessing what the future will hold. But um, <clears throat> I think what is important is, and I'm not suggesting that City Power <coughs> is not a credit worthy off taker, but I think from a South African um, overall South African perspective, <coughs> where we are now is especially when uh, we're talking about an IPP, um, <coughs> it's critically important from a bankability point of view that we preserve um, the credibility of a, a an off taker. Um, it's, it's key to the success of the IPP program. Um, uh, I believe that uh, much has been said about opening up um, the, the buyer model, um, and I believe it is a matter of, of time for that to happen. Um, but I think we need to also understand that at this point in time, <coughs> it's equally important to have a stable ESCOM. Um, and and I, I believe this is this is not a a, a quick solution to uh, resolving the the energy supply crisis um, with a, without excluding uh, the fact that a multiple buyer uh, scenario uh, could be of value to to the country. Uh, Paul, I'll also comment on that question. So. Um Sandra is right in that uh, the stability of, of an ESKIM or a restructured ESKIM needs to be a consideration into the future. If one for a moment assumes that ESKIM transmission and an independent system operator is, is separated, then the fundamental question then becomes, is that then the future single buyer or do we at that stage abolish the single buyer? If you ask for my vote, then abolish it right then. There were three other questions. One was around gas generation. Um, how will gas compare with the SCOM power? Um, and the, let me just list the others. And then Sasso's role in all of this, meaning in the gas uh, generation. And then um, there was something to do with the peak time uh, cooking area. <laughs> <laughs> You can see I'm LPG. starting to be very hungry now. So <laughs> yeah. LNG to LPG. <coughs> yes, exactly. yeah, so, I, Paul, I don't think there's a single question. Uh, uh, oh, I, I have the single answer to all your questions. But uh, no, there's no, for South Africa, I don't think there's an, an LNG, which is methane to LPG chain. That is doable. That's a gas to liquids plant. 
that, that produces longer molecules from the simple methane molecule. But uh, that, that process is so carbon intensive, to be frank, that uh, I think you ne need to find an another solution for that uh, or just import LPG. LPG is, 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 is like LNG, internationally traded and uh, is much more flexible in terms for, for small scale domestic use and industrial use and commercial uses, very transportable by, by, by road. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll comment, I won't comment on the, uh, the other one. There, there's not a single, so just on the, I think, there's not a single price for ESKIM, uh, cost or price for ESKIM generation. So what a um, Dupi Kassili would generate that is quite different to what in the, the two, two rands per, per kilowatt hour of a, uh, the, the first rounds of IPP contracts is quite dif different to what an open cycle gas turbine runs at when it runs on diesel or LNG. So th there's, there is today a, s a stacked bar chart and that's just on the short run operating costs uh, 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 and it's quite different to, to the actual cost of uh, dispatching either solar or wind. Um, and, and that will emerge as uh, as as the the uh, the South African electricity industry gets more sophisticated to deal with buyers and sellers and their service needs. Yeah. Okay. Can I can I comment also, uh, Paul, on your question around is it competitive to generate electricity from gas versus coal? I think. <coughs> It depends on what hat you wear. If, if, if you wear an Eskom hat, the answer is probably no. Right? So gas is more expensive than, than the bulk feedstock of coal, and, and obviously from, from that point of view, um, uh, it, it is gas, is gas is not competitive. However, if you start looking at this from an embedded generation point of view, and you ask yourself the question, and this is more from an energy user point of view, is gas competitive to what the Eskom price is? Yes, the answer is a big yes. So, which opens up, of course, a whole new debate, which is maybe we, 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 we need to carry on to another day. But the, the, the point is, if, if, you, if you have gas, let's say at 130 rand a gigajoule available, you're paying Eskom around about uh, 300 rand a gigajoule. You know, there's somewhere in between, if you've got capitalized costs, etc. there's a big advantage from an embedded generation point of view to, to generate your own electricity from, from gas. From an ESCOM perspective, no, I would, I would, I would uh, submit that. Of course, what's driven in a different context, that's because coal is abundant and cheap in South Africa. Um, you know, the US um, has done well in its climate commitments despite having um, senior leadership that probably doesn't prioritize that um, because gas is much cheaper than coal and there is switching going on just market driven. In, in electricity mm. generation. I, uh, I, I think added to that, the cost of new clean coal um, is certainly not the same as, as coal yeah. of today. Um, so uh, I think as we, as we progress through this journey, and I, and I think uh, what's interesting about this conversation is that gas is identified as or recognized as a transition fuel and we're having this debate around gas when um, the landscape is forever changing so how you think about coal how you think about renewables gas plays a role in in all of that um, uh, and that also relates to the strength of buyers how how we deploy gas in an embedded generation point, uh, uh, context. Um, I think the where we are now at the at the uh, at the point of promulgation of the new IRP, we will see from an app implementation point of view, uh, also in relation to ESCOM, a completely new configuration of 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 buyers. Um, I think that's going to happen. Should I go first? Yes. Uh, hi, Dougie, Dougie Bayless from Bridge Capital. Um, you don't mind if I sit. Um, so we're out of time. Uh, it's essential that we build energy um, delivery capacity and we seem to have some significant policy challenges and my question really goes to Andy. 
Um, you highlighted right at the beginning of your presentation how energy had created all sorts of other opportunities from space travel to all sorts of things. And yet, in the first presentation, embedded in there somewhere was this fascinating idea that we have a policy hierarchy that starts with the NDP, then goes down to industrial policy, and then lands up actually with subordinating energy policy. Mm -hmm. And I put it to you that that's completely the wrong way around. That, in my view, it actually should be energy policy that will actually enable the rest of those things. So, if I can use an analogy, if you had an elephant and you try to put methane into its tail end and expect a tree to come out the other end, I think you've got things the wrong way around. Uh, but maybe that's a bad analogy. I think you get the gist of my question. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, and then yes. Uh, the, the last one, so I yes. can go home. My name is Morgan Sitole from ESCOM. Um, oh. I thank you for such a brilliant presentation. and. Um, when you actually look at the panel there, I think it's really the, the, the genesis of a think tank yes. which is required in our energy industry. Yeah. Government doesn't understand even ESCOM and they don't understand the actual potential risk that this whole economy is facing. So why don't you begin to put your heads together to put a think, a think tank that will influence investment on the private sector, because we're sitting with almost 29% of our young people are not employed. And then attracting investment in the manufacturing side to actually be a catalyst as an off-taker of all this uh, energy sector. South Africa has opened up to the uh, Africa greater trade area, which will actually give the impetus to actually manufacture more consumable goods at the moment, uh, manufacturing has been going down the hill. So my plea is for the private sector, particularly the geniuses that we have here, to put a catalyst in the think tank. Thank you. Mr. Stolle um, has uh, laid the contract and has put the challenge onto the panel. So as you wrap up um, with your individual wrap ups, Maybe uh, can we answer the two questions that the gentlemen have uh, posed? Who wants to start? Just symbolically, let's have let, let's have the person representing customers in the room go first, Kali, and not not the government, not the private sector of investors in supply, but they who use it. So we we've just created that space for you. <laughs> Thanks for putting me on the spot. <laughs> so, so um, you know, I, 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 I think there's a there's a common theme uh, around this, and I've picked up from uh, Sandra's uh, talk from from yours, um, Andy, um, that it was mentioned that customers should be put first, or energy users, forget the word customers, energy users should be put first on the stakeholder list, right? At the moment, it doesn't happen in South Africa. Decisions get made without really focusing on the energy needs of the consumer. I think it was further mentioned, I think it was on, on, on Sandra's um, um, uh, presentation, that energy policy follows industrial policy. That's a very important point. Um, and we need to align our thinking around that particular uh, point. Government does not consume energy. Let's be frank. They're not a consumer of energy. Uh, the economy is. Um, I, think, I think there's a, there's a huge need that we've hopefully uncovered today, and it's something that we've argued for a long time, is uh, uh, what Mr. Satoli said up there, is, is this uh, absolute need for a think tank. Um, we have to aggregate our numbers across baskets of consumption. There's petrochemical, there's industry, and there's electricity. Uh, we're not in the billions and trillions uh, industry where big projects just happen. We're in South Africa. We have to face that reality, and we have to make good with what we have, and we have to consolidate and, and move forward from there. John made a very important point. It is not about these things don't happen anymore and we don't, certainly the South Africa doesn't have the balance sheet for building big projects and hoping that they will come. It's got to be feasible and it's got to be bankable. And there's only one way we can create that position 
and that is through through um, uh, putting putting all the demand numbers uh, together. Now, now it's your turn. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> well, as, you, as you as you as you wrap up, there is that question from Freddy that was posed directly to you. All right, um, <coughs> I've already said as one of my first comments, and uh, that that the interest of customers should come first. But let me just perhaps expand in in two lines what I mean by that. It means that customers should bear largely their own business risk. So if they make an investment in a factory, in a plant that is going to employ South Africans, they should bear that risk. But it is not right for them to bear the risk of somebody's energy supply project going abysmally wrong. If a, if, 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 uh, if the, uh, an, an energy plant that is supply any form of energy overruns on cost and schedule, then it is not right for customers to have to pick that up and that separation has to come otherwise and, and it, the, the, the more integrated the pl and central the planning is and the more of a central buyer there is the more the risk is that, that there's that risk transfer from the, the from the the energy supply projects being transferred to the customer customers should have choice and customers should at all times think about being competitive within South Africa but if they play on a global scale and there are so many South African companies that aspire uh, or already play on a global scale, then their competitiveness should should feature. Um, <coughs> I've had a, a conversion in, in life, and that conversion uh, was that the, for the future energy industry of this country, but also the world, it is government's role to set policy, and in the main, that policy should be in, executed by private sector players. In the main, whether that's for for IPPs for coal supply and the future power generators and the next power ge generators in the country. And that the government should be exquisitely articulate, exquisitely clear in its thinking and its policy framework and its policy priorities, but the execution should largely be left to the, the companies like Globally that, that do that in with such execution and with such discipline and who, 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 who can play globally. And last but not least, um, I, a word that did not feature in our conversation today was the South African economic competitiveness. Um, at all times in conversations such as the one that we have here about gas or about coal or about the economy or about electricity, we should at all times have some, some participant that speaks to and are we competitive and how do we improve our competitiveness? in a global context, because that is, that is what every other country is doing to constantly study where they rank in the World Economic Forum's competitiveness ratings or in the Chinese competitiveness ratings, etc. And I see, I see how Japan, Korea and China, th 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 uh, three of the big manufacturing countries of the world, how they constantly work to say, how do I improve my competitiveness compared to the other? I find that missing in our, in our discussion with ourselves, Chris. Hmm. Sure. I guess I would just offer by way of conclusion, I think uh, uh, energy transition is upon us, uh, whether we like it or not. Mm. Um, and that is going to play out in a intensely South African way. Um, and it's going to be institutional transition. It's going to be generation type transition. Um, it's going to be the basic energy building blocks of our economy transition, but it's also going to happen uh, on a regional basis. And tied up in the kind of double helix of that is the imperative for economic development. Um, and I think we're going to have to start putting on our regional citizenship hats uh, a lot more. Gas is about partnership. I think we need flexibility to manage that transition. I think gas at its core is a flexible solution um, and needs to be part of our toolkit as we, as we steward this, the, the, the road ahead. And that's going to require partnership between private sector and government, but it's also going to require partnership across the region. Um, so um, I, I just echo the kind of uh, call to, to engage in that dialogue and, and to take this forward. Thank you. Um, Sandra, you started it. Now you have the honor <laughs> of closing it. Go well, last uh, these gentlemen were, so, gentlemen were so eloquent, so um, I'll be brief. Um, 
I think what is important is that we realize that um, yes, energy is not an end in itself, but it is a critical means to an end. To to the analogy of the of the elephant, I will not go into the detail. Um, so, um, uh, in essence, uh, what I want to do is just, um, again, do a little bit of advertising from an uh, independent power producer's point of view. And by the way, it's, it's not only a renewables program. Um, uh, hopefully, we'll have a gas to power program. We've, we've done some um, coal projects as well, which we're battling to, to, to reach financial close. Um, but uh, across the board, uh, whichever technology, whichever fuel source, what we have demonstrated uh, as an IPP program is that South Africa is a trusted investment uh, destination. Yes, we are facing difficulties. We have um, uh, you know, severe challenges that we have to overcome. But to date, um, through our IPP program, we have on, on timeline issues, um, we have a 97% online achievement um, with, with our renewable projects. So these projects connect, connect to the grid in 97% of the time, uh, according to plan. It's on budget, uh, the private sector carries the risk, uh, which just reinforces the, the sentiments of my colleagues. Government has an extremely important role to play from a policy regulatory point of view, an enabling point of view, be that through uh, providing a credible off-taker or just providing an enabling environment for investment. Um, from an IPP office point of view, we take up the challenge of participating in the dialogue. We're very keen to participate in it. Uh, we're not going to achieve this on our own. We have to work together. Thank you for your time.